So the, the title of my talk is Integrating Single Neurons and Circuits in Stem Cell-Derived Neuronal Networks. And uh, you are going to hear the perspective of a system neuroscientist, which is me. So I have been trained for years as a system neuroscientist. Um, so I have a phrase here that, that I would also like to, for people to read. Also, probably you may have done it already. The brain is biological design is the word of a thinker named natural selection. We know that the brain is not fully optimized, but uh, it works pretty well for many of us. We must explore it to reverse engineer it and systematically understand it. So um, it's hard to derive brain functioning from uh, uh, physical laws and optimization principles only. Um, and only then we could fully understand the causes of brain diseases and perhaps cure them, find solutions to them. So, uh, and this is food for thought and it's something that I have thought a lot about it. Now, how a brain is made. So um, I'm gonna use my big red pointer that is the same color as the Canadian flag, I guess. That's something, but it's also very um, um, pop out kind of thing. So from the DNA strands that every cell carries in the body, and in this case, uh, the stem cells in the embryo, uh, you can have uh, transcription processes, uh, translation to make those into proteins. So basically, this is the, the basis of the genetic code. And from there, uh, for a particular case of neurons, you can have certain proteins expressed in the membrane that we call it ion channels. And those ion channels actually produce a phenomenon called action potential that many of us uh, um, uh, study. And those action potentials uh, 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 are basically the basis for cell communication. Now, from many cell types that could derive from those genetic codes, uh, from those ge genetic programs, uh, you have networks that happens in the brain and the communication between neurons in these networks produces a function. And the function that we know as behavior or behavioral functions or other functions in the body. I'm trying to introduce this because I think that is important, although I know that many people here, this is just uh, uh, some recap. Um, now, from the genome to the connectome, um, I would like to, to make a remark here. From the interaction of thousands of genes in intricate molecular pathways, neurons are born, the neurons that we have in the brain. Now, in single neurons, such interaction converts into fast information carrying events such as action potentials and receptor potentials. So there is uh, definitely uh, many more interactions that, than uh, uh, type of potentials we have. Basically, we have a few type of potentials in that neurons produce. And the interactions grows again. So the interactions uh, grow again when billions of neurons connect through trillions of synapses and communicate through action or receptor potentials to generate functions. So behavior in this case. And I like to, to represent that as a, as a sand clock, right? In which uh, on top, you have these thousands of interactions. Well, not, there is no thousands. There are many more interactions between thousands of proteins. Uh, and molecular neuroscience study this part of the clock, while system neuroscience focuses in the interactions between neurons in the different networks. While you have this event, Rhea, this narrow, in here in which we see those potentials where information kind of reduce the dimensionality of information. And uh, what we see is that most of us are working either in molecular neuroscience or in system neuroscience. And there are few people working in cellular neuroscience or in the intersection between these two things. Um, and I'm going to expand on that later. But the main point that I want to make here is that there are these two fat uh, ends of the clock that actually have most of the, of the, uh, of the interactions um, because the, the dimensionality of the problems. Now, what is system neuroscience? System neuroscience's uh, main goal is to understand how brain cells and circuits are organized to produce behavior in living organisms. The system neuroscientists study uh, ex vivo preparations like brain slices or neuronal cultures, for example as well as in vivo preparation, like living behaving organisms, animal models, or humans, uh, using tools such as single cell recordings, stimulation, fMRI, calcium, and imaging, and something that you may hear from many system neuroscientists, neuroscientists 
is that you cannot study things on a petri dish because things on a petri dish they are disconnected and they're different things i don't believe so uh, i i think that you could um but let's get to that later uh the tools of system neuroscience allowed uh, studying how neurons interact with one another and with other cell types uh, within a circuit during ex vivo and in vivo condition. And the data are, of course, used for test-to-test -test hypothesis regarding the role of different circuits in generating behaviors. So system neuroscientists are pretty focused these days on behavior and, and how circuits generate behavior. Therefore, they study full organisms. All right. I'm, in this talk, I'm going to talk about my scientific journey, so, uh, and I call it scientific revelations. <laughs> it's kind of a, a, a term that I, uh, I use. So in 1996, I was working as a physician, and I was treating people with epilepsy, ADHD, autism, and I was quite frustrated because I cannot cure most diseases of the nervous system. Actually, my brother was a surgeon, someone came with an appendicitis, Appendix goes off, the person is walking three days, and then it's just uh, incorporated into normal life. I was very frustrated about this because I couldn't cure pretty much nothing. I mean, compensate maybe 50% of my patient or 60% of my patients in epilepsy. And, um, and methylphenidate for uh, ADHD, I mean, that was prescribed, but um, I didn't have much an idea what was happening. Um, uh, really, 50% of the people got better, 50% didn't. So I just don't know enough about what caused disease. That was my conclusion. So I have to go deep to study disease. But I also found that we don't know how the brain works, period. So many of the circuits and many of the functions, they are already, uh, we haven't actually figured out. So then I figured out, I decided that I can go in 1996 to do a PhD and I can record single cell responses because I was doing EEG. So EEG is a signal that is useful clinically for a couple of things. Not very many, uh, uh, but uh, epilepsy is one of them. And I say, well, I want to study single neurons. And I want to do that in, in, in models that are similar to humans, so that was behaving uh, non-human primates. But in 2004, after I spent so much time doing that, like a year that I started my faculty job, I realized that it isn't enough to recording single unit responses. I must record the responses of many neurons at the time because uh, at that time the, the population doctrine came up and it was pretty clear that, uh, that that was necessary, but it's so complex. It is so complex. So now I have uh, a jump in 2014 where I realized that it's possible making neurons from fibroblast. So as many of you, so at the beginning of the 2000s, um, uh, Gemanaka discovered the iPSCs, uh, the way to turn uh, adult cells into stem cells. And then uh, uh, I believe in 2013 was that Sasai had some of the first uh, organoids and three-dimensional things that happens. And, um, uh, and I realized, wow, this is possible. So I can record the activity of a small control network of neurons, and I actually can make sense out of it. And I tell you what is so difficult to make sense in the living organism by showing you some examples later. So then in 2022, I decided I'm going to do a, a, a sabbatical, studying a little bit this problem because it looks to me like the genome is a cookbook and cortical circuits are made following recipes. So you can have a recipe to make uh, for brain uh, organoids, so you can have a recipe to make organoids that uh, simulate the cortex, or even uh, uh, motor neurons and things like that. So amazes me how deterministic the process was. And in 2023, uh, I say, well, it is possible to make brain circuits using recipes and connect them to the living brain. I think it's possible. There are several papers out of there, but that's what I'm here in California now, and I'm trying to figure these two different last revelations whether uh, I'm going to continue. So I'm going to start with the first one. Um, uh, in 1996, when I realized that I could record, this, uh, record the response of single neurons, and before moving to uh, stem cell-derived networks, I want to give you an intro, just a very short, uh, of what we do in system neurophysiologies. Um, so we can measure single neural activity in ex vivo and in vivo uh, using different techniques in system neurophysiology. So first of all, in the slices, uh, uh, as many of you know, for example, this is a picture of the neuron. There is a technique that is called patch clamp that you can actually go with a micropipette. You can penetrate the, the, the wall of the cell 
here it is the cell the, when you approach the micro pipette and now you can actually make a, a communication by aspirating here so between the inner part of the cell and your micro pipette environment and now you can actually uh, stimulate uh, with different currents so as many of you know the, the, the inner part of the cell is negatively charged usually more than the, exter the, the external part of the cell which is positively charged now you can inject currents um, um, positive or negative in the in, in the cell and now you can get this beautiful event that is called the action potential we talk a lot about it the all or none famous action potential of Hodgkin and Huxley uh, uh, models and you can actually uh, uh, do that in in, a, in an isolated neurons and then you could also depending on the stimulation pulses that you use in this case you use a square pulse you can evoke trains of action potentials and those trains of action potential is what we call a response patterns. And the trains of action potentials could be like this. For example, you inject a square pulse in the neuron and then start producing action potentials late or here producing very uh, uh, early and it's kind of irregular, the firing of the neuron. So this is just a summary of what patch clam is. So uh, one of the things that you could do with patch clam, uh, you can actually remove parts of the cortex that happens during surgical interventions, for example, in patients, or it also could happen in animal models. You could actually remove parts of the cortex um, or, or, or certain parts of the brain. And then you can actually uh, keep this tissue alive and you can do patch clam recordings in this tissue. So basically you can ex expand from animal models to humans in the structure of those circuits studying studying the, the, the response property of single neurons. And here, one of the things that I wanted to show. So um, the single neurons, you can stimulate it with different pulses. These are different type of pulses from the Allen Institute uh, website. You can do a ramp. So it means that you're injecting a, a, a ramp kind of current uh, uh, in the neuron. You can do a long square pulse. That is one of the most used ones. And the long square pulse, you can inject a negative positive currents, for example, to hyperpolarize the cell. I'm sorry, negative currents to hyperpolarize the cell. Or you can inject positive currents to depolarize the cell. And short squares, different configurations that you can do with devices that you can do that. And then uh, you can see how the cell responds to that. And I'm going to give you an example. This is the first data slide. This is a long square pulse protocol in which we take a neuron from the prefrontal cortex and actually we inject either uh, uh, hyperpolarizing pulses, which we make the membrane potential more negative, or we can inject depolarizing pulses, which we make the membrane potential more positive. And when you inject an, uh, hyperpolarizing pulses, of course, there is some, uh, this is a recording, a voltage recording that we do of the membrane potential. And what you see here is that there is no spikes when you hyperpolarize the cells, of course. There are other events that are also interesting, and we call it subthreshold events. Uh, but the most interesting thing is that these cells that you start getting to a certain level of depolarization and start firing action potential. And this is what we call a regular spiking cell. This is very likely an interneuron. So uh, uh, that, fires, that spikes very, very, very fast uh, when you put these, these uh, poles. And as long as you have the poles on here, so the neuron is going to be firing. Now, many system and neurophysiologists, what we do is what well, we take that and we reduce it to digital events. Basically, we have a threshold here, and every time that there is an action potential, I have a little line here. And those are the different sweeps with the different current intensities. And you can see as you increase the intensity of the current, the cell fires more and more. This is what we call it a fast spiking cell, uh, and it spikes very regularly. It doesn't matter, the distance between the action potentials doesn't change at all. But if you switch your electrode to another cell, for example, and in this case, uh, this is most likely a pyramidal cell, what you find is that if you inject exactly the same current pulses, so what you will see that this cell gives a completely different response. So the cell fires a little here at the beginning and they start adapting. The action potential start becoming slower uh, and slower uh, appearing. And you can see that in this digital uh, uh, frame uh, picture of that. And this cell is what we call it a bursting or adapting cell. And this cell, basically what it does is you stimulate it with a square pulse. And it doesn't matter how long the pulse is, the cell is going to respond during the first, I don't know, perhaps 200 milliseconds or less. And then it's going to stop responding. So uh, that's what we call it an adapting cell. And the first question when I was um, 
um, uh, studying these issues was like, why? Why these cells are producing different, actually, uh, uh, trains of action potentials? Um, one thing that you can do is to quantify this uh, action potential, what we call it the baseball card. We call it the baseball card project because the Toronto Blue Jays is the only team that we have in Canada, though. Uh, <laughs> and uh, although they are not sponsoring this at all, but we call it the baseball card project still. So, um, and what we do is that we have different uh, measurements of, of this, uh, and then we can characterize the properties of the cell, looking at the interval between the spikes, looking at the stimulation, that uh, the level of stimulation for the first spike, looking at morphology of the spikes, different things. And we got a baseball card for the cell. Now, with these baseball cards, we can build a multidimensional space of those variables, and we can start asking the question, how div diverse are response patterns in single neurons? And this is a question that interested us the same way that uh, a linguistic could be interested in what are the single words in the language, or what are the phonemes that actually uh, 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 produce uh, words in the language. So to have you an understanding that. What interesting is also that these response patterns, they correspond to a, to, to a very large degree to the morphology of the neurons. So these neurons, for example, is a pyramidal cell, so this is the apical dendrite. We're not showing the axons here. We reconstruct the axons, but I'm not showing it here. So, and this is the apical dendrite. Suppose this is just the surface of the brain and the apical dendrite goes up. And this is the morphology of the pyramidal cell. And this is an interneuron that looks bipolar. It has a dendrites here and the dendrites on the other side. And um, most likely they correspond to the phenotypes that I show you. Uh, this could be a fast spike in cells, for example, SST or PV cell. Uh, and this could be a pyramidal cell. Um, and that was impacted me very strongly because I say, well, when we build circuits in a network and people using uh, model network models, all the neurons are the same. But this is not what happens in the brain. Not all the neurons are the same. The transfer function of those neurons, which is what, what happens when you input something and whatever you get out of it, this transformation is different in different cell types. So something that we did we, uh, this is a little bit of a complex slide, but, co but follow me with the pointer um, because it's a very recently made slide. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a project that we have um, in our Neuronex consortium um, that we take electrophysiological properties and we put it in a UMAP space and then we build these different clusters of neurons. And let's see if I can go with you. So if, if you can follow me here in this part. For example, these are neurons in mice from the Allen Institute database, and this is from our database from macaque monkeys and from uh, marmosets. And what you see is that this firing phenotype seems to be very similar across the three species. So those response patterns, it's not only that they're diverse, it's also that they seem to be preserved across the species. Um, and there is the same thing, for example, you see, um, by the way, I would say that this looks like a koala, but it's a marmoset, so we have to work on that. <laughs> this is not a koala, it's actually a marmoset monkey. Um, if you look at the same thing here, mouse, uh, for example, and other cell types here, uh, that has a little bit of adaptation on regular spiking, um, uh, that is the same across the different cell types. But we also find cells that are, for example, in the marmoset, we find this cluster of cells that seems to be just only in that species. So what that may happen is that a species, they have adaptations that they produce that kind of uh, uh, um, uh, response patterns. So maybe each species uh, brain has a, a certain language that is common to everyone, but uh, has a certain uh, uh, words that only uh, that species has. Uh, and I'll give you an example of the uh, Mexican Spanish, for example, and Cuban Spanish. Uh, um, uh, they have words that we don't understand what they're saying, and, uh, and, and the, but, but we should still understand each other very well, or Spanish from Spain or whatever it is, or English from the U.S. and Britain and Canada. Uh, Canada is somehow in the middle, so we understand everything. So nah, that's just... Uh. So anyway, the, the main point here is that there is a diversity of uh, um, patterns across the species. Um, and something that impacts me is that considering that the development of the different species occur under different environmental conditions, it is striking how similar neuronal firing patterns are across the species. So what that, the only conclusion that you can make out of this is that the making of firing patterns seems deterministic to a larger degree. I mean, for no one, it's a secret how, how long the, the human brain takes to 
to, to develop, how long the mouse brain takes to develop, and, and how different those brains are in terms of uh, uh, size, frontal lobe, expansion, different things. And still, those cell types seem to be preserved. Not fully, there's also certain differences, but it seems to be preserved. And that has to be encoded somewhere that it has to be the genome. So it's preserved, and those programs for making neurons must be programs that are quite deterministic from my point of view. Quite deterministic doesn't mean that they are fully deterministic. You might be able to disrupt them too, uh, and that's what, probably what disease does, but they are deterministic. So, um, and I want to, to make this uh, uh, remark. In a similar manner as molecular neuroscientists see genes encoding proteins as the basis for the making uh, uh, of neurons, system neuroscientists see firing patterns in single neurons are the basis for making neural codes. So firing patterns are the worst forming the sentences of neural codes. So that's how system neuroscientists work, and I'm trying to, to explain you a little bit about how my training was and how uh, we think in a, in a way. But patch clam is in principle reductionist. So I mean, if you think about it, it removes a lot of complexity. Neurons are stimulated with artificial patterns, the square pulses. I mean, no neuron in the brain is receiving a square pulse through a micropipette. So, uh, and synaptic transmission is in many instances blocked. So to explore these properties, you block synaptic transmission in the slide. And not all the neurotransmitters are in the slide. So that's the argument of many synthesis and neuroscientists that, that study behavior. So additionally, in a slice, the inputs into the local circuit are removed. So if you have an hippocampal slice, you remove endorhinal cortex input. Or a prefrontal cortex slice, you remove visual cortex inputs. So um, therefore, uh, the same question that I asked, how do single neurons fire during behavior? And I'm not going to, to present much of this. I'm just going to show you one of our single neurons firing here. Um, and this is just a technique that we use that is called extracellular recordings, in which we go with an electrode very close to a neuron. This is a hair. Um, and then these are the, the potentials that you can record. They look like action potentials, like during patch clamp, but they're a little bit noisier and you can have two neurons identifies in this action potential. But when you put the animal behaving or, or, the, or the human or, or whatever preparation you are using, so how does it look? So we did uh, this experiment in which we train a, a, a macaque monkey to, to navigate uh, a virtual reality maze, and we're recording the responses of single neuron here in the prefrontal cortex and here in the hippocampus. And what you see here in blue are the spike trains. So maybe I should explain the task a little bit. The animal is going, navigating this, and the wall turns gray here. And now um, there are two objects that will appear here at the end. If the, worst, if the walls of the maze are gray, the animal should go to one color pattern. If the walls are uh, um, uh, another color, the animal should go to another color pattern. But the most important thing here is that uh, this, this firing, it seems to be happening in V1, and it seems to be that, that that is not as clean as what we did uh, using patch clamp. So many of the uh, system neuroscientists, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out those response patterns and how that relates to behavior. But what we found for many years, actually, and I was studying that until 2004, was that um, single neurons do not explain most of the behavior uh, uh, um, fully or, or explain very little, actually, of the variability seen during behavior. Therefore, we turn into uh, populations of neurons. And these are a couple of papers that were very influential. Uh, um, so one is the more than a decade ago, and that one is more recently, about the population doctrine. And the whole idea is that neurons in populations are actually uh, producing the substrates for those behaviors. So one neuron alone doesn't do it. It has to be a team of neurons, and those are populations of neurons that do that. But populations of neurons has a tricky aspect to it. Yet you cannot build population of neurons by recording from one neuron at a time. You really have to record from many neurons at the time because there is something called correlative variability between neurons. And this correlative variability actually influences the ways that neurons encode information. It's a statistical phenomenon that I would be very happy to expand on. But this correlative variability, it could affect the amount of information encoded in circuits. So therefore, you need to record from the neurons simultaneously to know what is happening. So that was in 2004 when I had this revelation, but it is so complex. So let's see what we can do about it. 
to explore how do many single neurons fire together during behavior. And I'm going to show you something. Uh, it's an experiment to study attention in humans and monkeys. Um, basically, follow me here. So if you fixate this dot in the middle of the screen, and actually, uh, and you press a key, you don't have a key in front of you, but you could be thinking about how to press a key. So, and I can show these patterns that we call it a, a Gabor. So in, in, in this quadrant of the visual field, you still need to keep fixating. And then I show four different patterns. And the task for, for, uh, for you would be to detect when this pattern changes orientation, and then you release the key when the pattern changes orientation. So that's basically the task. Uh, now, how do I know that you're doing this? Because you press the key, I show you exactly the same task, but I change the orientation of the other pattern. And if you release the key, so I know that you're cheating. You're not really attending to that pattern, right? <laughs> so you, or you didn't understand the instructions. So monkeys and humans can do that. Uh, hold the key and don't answer. So what we can do is to implant actually microelectrode arrays. This is the, the, the HUTA array that started, I think that in early uh, 2000s, um, and a huge array is a 10 by 10 matrix of electrodes that you can implant in the brain. They're actually clinical trials with the huge array, and you can record the responses of 100 different electrodes um, uh, doing that. And this is something that may be the first resemblance to what you are doing with MEAs in, 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 in networks. So we can do in the cortex exactly the same thing as you do with MEA in, in, in the stem cell drive networks. And I'm going to show you this movie. In this movie, uh, there are four different conditions. These are four different trials. One, when the animal is uh, uh, attending to the left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, uh, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. And we can actually track the neural activity in this array as this happens. As you see, the yellow is the neural activity, so spikes happening, and these are the different things. And now during the attentional period where this is the same as stimulation in all the, the, the things, you can see actually how there is different configurations of activity, even if the stimulation is the same, there is different, uh, that you see on the screen, there are different configurations of activity. What I want to say, if, if I take this MEA activity and I put it into a classifier, I can tell you where the monkey was attending to just by looking at the pattern of activity in the brain. And this is something that we are engaged to as system neuroscientists, finding those patterns of activity in the brain. So, um, and I know that many of you are engaged doing this in MEAs, in, uh, and I will get uh, in a little bit to this. So we can have, uh, we can take that and do some image processing and identify maps. For example, when the animal is attending here, there is activation in this yellow region. When it's attending green, the activation here. When it's attending blue, uh, it's act, uh, uh, activating here. When I blue, green, and the colors mean the quadrants of the visual field that it's attending to. So now I can decode where the animal is attending when this is happening. I can do that in a human too. So ensemble codes are complex and needs to be studied recording ensemble responses, not pulling single neuron responses individually. That's something that uh, we need to, we have figured out. Now, it is extremely challenging to document the responses of neurons in entire brains during behavioral tasks. Imagine that I have a race like that in the entire brain. The damage would be crazy. Calcium imaging is still way too slow to do that. And you cannot cover an entire brain. Maybe a mouse brain, but a human brain, if you have seen the sizes of those things one beside the other, it's just uh, it's almost not impossible. Neither a marmoset or a, or, a, or a macaque brain, but that thing. So the brain... I would say, and, and that's where I'm going to switch to the other part of the talk, is the most inaccessible body organ to exploration and manipulation. So the brain has consistency of jelly. If many of you or someone has taken a brain, whether it is a mouse or a human, it's a very consistent it's jelly. So it's protected by the scalp, skull, and three membranes. So it's a pretty inaccessible. Uh, neurosurgeons, neurosurgeries are long, most of them. Uh, a damage to a small region can result in paralysis or even death. So we know that. The brain doesn't regenerate. There are no effective technologies to repair damaged brains. Uh, I hope that they will be, but for now, actually, there are not effective technologies. And animal models played a critical role in research in the brain. However, human brains have diverged from those of other species at cellular and circuit level. So some diseases may be unique to humans. So we have no many options here. But 
there is an option, and this is this, uh, what this is about, probably. Um, over the last decade, it has been a revolution in biomedical research. So the human genome sequencing technologies, as many of you know, uh, the cell reprogramming technologies, the tissue engineering technologies for in vitro system, the matrigel and the whole idea of making organoids in 3D, and genome editing technologies where you can take cells and you can actually change literally the, the cookbook recipes by rewriting the recipes or putting something else. So this has been a, um, a revelation for me and, and, and I can't have enough of all the the talks that you have posted on the website and things like that in this aspect. So in 2014, I realized that it's possible making uh, neurons from fibroblast uh, or for other cell types, and, and you can record activity in a small neural network, so the complexity can be reduced. And this complexity, you can treat this complexity in a way that you can crack what those circuits are doing, how they are made, what are the operations. So um, we may be able to use the same techniques as in system neurophysiology to explore the neurophysiology of stem cell-derived neurons and neuronal networks. So in fact, we are doing that, or many of us, or some of us are doing that. Um, the advantages, it is a less complex system. It is amenable to molecular and system manipulations. It replicates features of mature neuronal, uh, neurons and circuits. And I say features because we know that the disadvantage is that we don't know the degree to which stem cells derive networks uh, and neurons approach the develop uh, nervous system structure and function. So this is something that is still a question, but what I feel is that the more uh, stem cell research pushes in this direction, the more uh, resemblance we get, which is a good news. So there is also a revolution in multi-electrode array recording technologies. This is not what we have. This is the new three-brain system that uh, we intend to, to, to purchase uh, at some point because we get more electrodes. But the idea is that you can record, you can put the, the, the cells in those wells on the electrodes and you can record with incredible resolution uh, uh, the response of nerve. The same way that I show you, we were recording in the brain um, uh, with huge arrays. The only thing that huge arrays don't even, they're not even close to these resolutions. Or even the neural link, uh, um, uh, so in machine, I don't think that can even be close to approach these kind of resolutions now. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about iPSCs, uh, or, or, uh, sorry, stem cell derived networks that uh, in Red Syndrome that may be um, for interest to many of, of you. Uh, I was at uh, as in, in a meeting in Toronto and I met uh, James Ellis at, uh, at that meeting, who is a stem cell biologist, and, and James actually and I, we had a conversation coming from different opposite things. At the beginning of the conversation, we didn't understand what each other, each other because we don't know what we were talking about. James was talking about his molecular makeup, the, the upper part of the sand, of the, of the sand clock. And I was talking about the lower part of the sand clock, how connectivity between neurons. And I say, James, we have to do something about this. Let's write a grant. We wrote a grant for the Simons Foundation. We could fund it, and somehow we started this work that is not only red, red, uh, red syndrome, but it's also um, uh, Chang2 mutations. So basically, I understand, that's my understanding of what James uh, does, which is, uh, I'm not probably making, um, I mean, I, I'm not being fair here, probably it's, it goes much more than that into this. But you can take cells, stem cells, lines, you can reprogram the stem cell lines, and actually, um, you can, with gene editing technologies, you can generate uh, MECP2 uh, mutant cells. You can knock out the MECP2, as many of you know. And you can do that in different cell lines, actually. Uh, this sense li this, these are two are knockout. This is an embryonic cell line. This is an, an induced uh, pluripotent stem cell line. And, and all of these are human. And this is actually a human patient that has just uh, um, a missense mutation, and, and it, 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 has, it doesn't have the full uh, uh, phenotype, but uh, it's diagnosed as a red syndrome. And this is, uh, we're not going to talk about that, this is a shank too. Uh, but that's what James did, and then what you could do is to find the help of uh, system neurophysiologists like me or like Mike Salter, and actually do patch clamp, which is what Mike Salter was doing in those cells, and, and do MEAs which is uh, uh, um, something that I do. And that's the interesting thing about that is that 
we combine two levels of analysis, cellular levels and, and, and network level in this kind of thing. It looks like uh, easy, but it took us uh, several years to get together to an agreement on that. All right, so uh, now we can study single neurons, red syndrome uh, uh, knockout, uh, single neurons that have MECP2 knockout, and we can study also networks. And I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, the data. First of all, I mean, I, I don't have to recap that, but red syndrome is a postnatal neurodevelopmental disorder that affects females almost exclusively. It is characterized by normal early growth and development. And then there is a period in which development slows down. Uh, there is loss of purposeful use of hand, distinctive hand movement, slow brain and head growth, and problems with walking, seizures, and intellectual disability. So this is actually uh, um, a very, uh, it impairs patients, if many of you have seen red syndrome patients. Depends on the phenotype, but um, it could be hard on families. So uh, caused by, it's caused by heterozygous loss of function mutation of the gene uh, MECP2 in the X chromosomes, and many of you know. And uh, we have narrowed down the knowledge um, to that say. So there are several reviews on what red syndrome does in the nervous system. And I'm pointing out here a paper by Carol Marchetto that is uh, here at UCSD, Yun Lee, she's in Toronto, and Rebecca. So, and, um, and particularly in those papers, uh, the, the conclusion that you can have is that these uh, MECP2 uh, uh, mutations uh, produce morphological changes in the neurons as well as hypoconnectivity. So, the red syndrome affects the two levels that I show you system neurophysiologists were interested in. The individual cell, so the cells are smaller, so they have fewer dendrites, fewer, uh, and also uh, the network. When you put the cells on the network, the cells are hypoconnected. They have fewer synapses. So that's basically uh, two different levels that you can have. And what attracted me to this is like, wow, you can have a network of, let's say, excitatory only neurons. That is what I'm going to show here. Uh, in a red syndrome. And now you can actually, uh, with, with the same genotype as a red syndrome patient, and you can study that with my tools, with, with the system neurophysiology, uh, neuroscience tools. So the first thing that we, that you need to find out in those networks is that neurons are producing action potentials. So when James obtained those cultures and actually produced the neurons, uh, the first thing was to obtain action potential. This is the wild type without the knockout, and this is a red syndrome knockout. This is an example of action potential. So they have all the features of the action potentials. And uh, the scales here, I apologize, are a little bit different. But the action potentials don't look very different between the two of them. So these cells get to fire action potentials when you do patch clamp in the cells. Now, if you were to make a baseball card of those cells, the first thing that we look is to look at baseball's card of wild type. And as you see here, so if we inject current pulses, I'm going show only the, the depolarization pulses. So if we depolarize a cell through a, a pipette, so you can see that the cell is firing action potentials, maybe a little bit higher frequency here, and then at the end, it kind of adapts a little bit. Um, but this wild type cell fires action potential, and from all this um, graph, I would ask you to focus in this uh, current as a function of firing rate, in which if you increase the current, you see that the firing rate of the cell increases. It's quasi linear. It's not exactly linear. There is a saturation point here where the cells it say, I can fire more than that, so you can increase your stimulation as much as you want, but I can go farther than that. But usually it stabilizes at that point. Now, if you do that with a, with a, a basal cut for a red syndrome, you get a different result. The red syndrome cell actually starts very nicely, but then run out of juice. The red syndrome cell actually goes up, 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 and then when you increase the stimulation, same as simulations uh, 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 intensities, you see that it, it, it runs out of juice and it starts actually going down. Like the cells, is, it's not that I cannot produce more spikes, it's just that I have to produce less spikes now. So that's one of the features. If you look at into these, uh, they look very different. So and remember, those cells are um, um, from uh, isogenic control. So basically, this is an isogenic control of the cell of the red syndrome cell. And what we could say is that the red syndrome definitely affects the making of the cell. 
and not only affects the making of the cell, affects the making of the words that the cell is speaking to the next cell in the, in the, um, in the network. So I could put that in a little bit more um, um, uh, format to understand. Uh, so basically what you see in this graph is just the time that the stimulation lasts. Uh, here what you see is the intensity of the current of the stimulation. And what you see in this scale is the firing rate of the cell. So when you do that, you see that the wild type cell has this uh, uh, increase in the spikes here and the higher the intensity, the more spikes, and it has a slow adaptation here, but it still it's firing the spikes on, uh, as long as you keep the stimulation going. But when you look at the red syndrome cell, first of, thing, first of all, what you see is that the maximum, which is the yellow here, is not all the way on top, it's right here in the middle. It looks almost like a bandpass filter. So um, what happened is that the maximum intensity is here in the middle. If you crank up the intensity too much, the cell is gonna give you fewer spikes. And the other thing is that the cells adapt much more quickly. So, uh, and this is a feature of the, of the red syndrome cells. So the cells are not, um, um, the, 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 the words that they, they contribute with are different. They're speaking a little bit of a different language. So what I can do here is um, uh, to make a, a, um, uh, a general, you know, statistics of this with confidence intervals. I'm sorry, the N is not here. Um, we had about 40 or 50 of this in these um, um, uh, cells. And what you can see is that the red syndrome cell actually fires with lower current. And that was a little bit surprising to us because the red syndrome cell is more excitable. Even if the cell has all this, uh, uh, it cannot produce a more worse, it's more excitable in a way that if you inject a little bit of current, the cell is already firing. But it runs out of juice very quickly and the cell actually stops firing here. While if you look at the wild type cell, it keeps going on. And of course the cell saturates, but it's going on and on. So this cell seems to be more like uh, make it for uh, long races. Uh, the red syndrome cell seems to be a, a cell made for a short race. And I would say development is probably a long race. So there is a long time and, and a lot of activity going on. So now um, I want to say that if you want to play with this, we have a database resource that we started making. I'm just going to switch here to the website. This is a database resource in which we have put all the red syndrome cells that we, um, that we have recorded from. Uh, in, in electrophysiology. This is a little bit similar to any database. So these are the different phenotypes that, uh, genotypes, I'm sorry, that, that we have in the database with different mutations. And these are different parameters. But let me just, uh, one thing that I wanted to do is let's say if this is a wild type CLT. You can expand this here and then you can see uh, uh, the firing rate of these cells. So this could uh, serve as a guide to compare these cells with cells in normal phenotypes in mouse across the species, how they do. And let me just switch to a, a cell um, that is um, maybe a red syndrome cell, um, they say from Weber, uh, which is an uh, embryonic cell uh, stem cell line. Uh, this Weber looks good, uh, disappoint me a little bit, but uh, you have a lot of variability here. Um, but there are other cell types that, um, that oh, this one looks good too. <laughs> No, no oh, oh, because I'm a wild type. I'm sorry. The, the, I'm a wild type, so I have to pay attention to what I do. Uh, in the red syndrome, um, let's look at this one uh, for the red syndrome. Um, and you can see that, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, for the red syndrome cell. Anyway, you, you can navigate this website. I, I shouldn't take the time to do this. Um, but I just wanted to show you the functionality. And here, here, for example, this is a red syndrome cell. And right away, you can go into the website and say, look at how its cell looks. For... So uh, we're trying to convince the Simons Foundation to sponsor this project because I have a postdoc doing the informatics on this and putting this on the website. It has been a little bit hard, and um, we hope that we don't have to crash uh, before we complete the project. Um, the other thing is that you can actually also um, switch to um, another database that we have uh, for non-human primates and human cells. Uh, or you can do it in the Allen website. And this database basically contains cells recording from slices. So these are actually mature cells. 
and you can look at the phenotypes of the mature cells, for example, here, you look at this phenotype looks similar to the wild type in the red syndrome. So you do have electrophysiological features uh, of the wild type, I say wild type red syndrome, apologize for that, of the wild type. Um, they have electrophysiological features that look very similar to, to cells that we record in the cortex, in fully formed cortex of a, I don't know how many years old, a human or non-human primate. So you can come into these databases and you can actually uh, play with that and look at what the resemblance of a certain cell type is to what we find in that. By the way, you could do that in the Allen Institute website too. Um, um, uh, we, we have this primary cell type database that is what we have uh, available. Um, this is a sponsored by Neuronex, um, um, so that's what we are doing. But the main point is that you can compare just back to back both now. Now, one thing that we figure out, um, um, by that time I hope that I convince you that neurons are not all alike. Each neuron is computationally sophisticated. So these details are important to consider when building biological motivated network models. When we have those models that have like 10,000s of neurons and all of them look alike, we know that for AI purposes, those models may be great, but for biological purposes, I don't think that those models uh, will approximate what we have in biological networks. So um, one thing that we turned to was the extracellular recordings um, in microelectrode arrays. And here, this is a picture of the Maestro system and, and what you can do is to have a cell, uh, in this case, it's a 2D culture, it's not an organoid. And these 2D cultures are, um, uh, cells are at different locations relative to these black electrodes that we see. And we record the spontaneous activity of the cell. We can do pharmacology. We can do so many things with this. That is just, um, um, I mean, I, I wish that I could have a lab with 100 people to do this, but that's no reality. So the best way is to collaborate with many people to do this and also stem cell biologists, they know what they're doing. So in terms of this, so many of the things uh, we, we need to be very collaborative. But what happens in those networks is that we know that they start as single neurons and then single neurons start to wire and, and then as single neurons wire, we can discover patterns in the, in the network. Something that I'm showing this because I fell in love with this field when I saw this. This is a, a, a recording of different channels in a, uh, in a MEA from Axion. And here is just the response patterns of single neurons. And when I saw this, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the beginning I said, well, this is epilepsy on a dish. But I realized, no, 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 wait a minute. And it was a paper that Allison published uh, not long ago where he looked at developmental patterns. And of course, we have developmental pediatricians here in the, in the, in the audience. And um, when we look into that, uh, something that, that I was struck me was how rhythmic this thing is. All the neurons are firing at the same time. And in the cortex, unless uh, you're looking into a sleep state or you're looking into epilepsy, you rarely see such a synchronic behavior in the adult cortex. But if you go to the embryonic stages, this is happening in embryonic stages. And I realized that uh, this is software. This is a software that comes out of the of genetic programs, of the programs to make those cells. And that's the only conclusion that I can arrive to because it's so stereotypical, this pattern of uh, rhythmicity that must have been a software that is self-written as the cells go and they look very similar across the species with different difference in frequency, et cetera. But well, you can take those and you can actually make, um, um, uh, strike the responses of single neurons and then you can look at into how uh, these cells fire and you can quantify many of the things. And something that I, that I wanted to go deep into, I say, James, I think that what you're recording is some sort of LFP, multi-unit activity. But when I went into the, uh, the different channels, I could isolate single neurons in those channels, which is striking to me. I mean, these are the shapes of action potential passed through a spike sorting algorithm that we use in, in many systems labs. And what you can see here, you have a couple of cells and here you have one cell that actually is, uh, um, so those are single neurons firing. I know that, that this is not a, um, a discovery, but for many of us, this is very important, especially for system neurophysiologists. Are we listening to a single cell or are we listening to a group of cells that may be doing different things to each other? And all what you get 
is just the ensemble, right? It's like a soloist uh, 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 and a group of people singing at the same time. So the other thing was that we found that in week one, the cells were firing quite sparse, right? And, and, but as the cells were developing in those cultures in week two and week three, we see the cells firing these bursts of action potentials and then silence. Burst and silence, burst and silence. And many of you may have seen this pattern again and again in these uh, networks. Um, and what must be happening is that the cells are very, they're wired very weakly at the beginning, then they start wiring up. And as the cells wire up, those patterns become more and more effective. So synchrony, synaptic transmission happens very fast. And then uh, the cell fire the burst and, and then a period of quiescence. So why the period of quiescence? This is a good question. And what's the frequency of the period of quiescence? But I think that this may be the best way to keep the network alive, the homeostasis in the network, so that you can fire a lot of action potentials. Now you have to recover. You cannot fire a lot of action potential forever because you're gonna go run out of ATP or energy in general. So, and there is this period of quiescence, but maybe a very good effective way to release uh, transcription factors or things that you need for synaptic plasticity. So, um, the definition of a burst, I should have said that before, is a train of a spike in rapid succession followed by a period of quiescence. That's what we call it a burst in system neurophysiology. Different people could cut, call burst different things. People in the hippocampus, they have different frequency as in the cortex, different things for between systems. But in general, that's a good definition, I believe. So now, what happens to MECP2 mutants uh, relative to isogenic controls? What we found was that the birds, they have different frequency. They were basically more space in time. But we also found that they last a little bit longer. And I'm not going to talk about that. This is data that we're analyzing now, because I think that hidden here, there is a, a, a different structure. But in general, uh, the mutant had a slower burst. They were bursts that were a little bit longer, and, and they were slowly. It's the word more slow. So whatever these neurons are trying to do, uh, they're probably not as effective as a wild-type neuron. But in biology, one question that I always have to ask is, is this something that is a, a, a phenomenon that is directly related to it, or is it a compensatory phenomenon? Because the cell is a system, per se, and the whole dish with many uh, neurons in the network may be compensating for what is happening at the level of single cells. I don't think that this question has been answered yet, but, um, but it's an interesting one, and I'm gonna leave you with some, uh, an important question at the end that I think that is important, and I don't have an answer. Maybe you can actually tell me. And we also did a database resource on this. So basically, you can actually go to um, this database resource to in extracellular electrophysiology, and then you can see the different cell lines in the MEAs, and you can come into, I'm, I'm, I mean, if you go into early weeks, you won't see much. So you see this is part pattern, is part, uh, firing. But if you go into weeks uh, five and six, let me just um, uh, go into week five and six, you will see how, or week four, how the, the network patterns appear here. And you can choose different phenotypes. You can choose the wild type, or you can choose the red phenotype. And our intention, uh, we put some of the Allison's data here, Dr. Motri, uh, that he uh, um, contributed with, and we are expecting to put some from other labs uh, uh, in here. But this is a fantastic resource. The reason why these are fantastic resources is because there are people doing computational modeling, actually, that can take this resource and make models of what is happening exactly here, biophysical models and realistic models. And I, I'm gonna show you some of the usefulness of those models. Um, so, um, but the, what I was telling you that I find it a little uh, contradictory is that when we look at single neurons in the wild type on the red syndrome, the single neuron in the wild type, what we said, uh, it seems to be firing more spikes. Uh, it's almost like a linear filter kind of thing that adapts at some point here. And the red syndrome, fires and they run out of juice and has a strong adaptation here. It doesn't fire more spikes. But if you look at the network level, and what, what I'm showing here is developmental age. Here is intensity of stimulation, but here is developmental uh, stage in, in weeks. 
and here the same thing, the time, and here the intensity of, of the activation, uh, firing rate, um, you see a, a, a different pattern. You see that actually the wild type network, you see that cells fire very short bursts, and then they don't fire anything else. They just go silent, so about preparing for the next burst. But the, the red syndrome actually does the opposite as here. The red syndrome bursts are actually longer than the ones in the wild type network. So if you look at this, almost like a diagonal pattern where this one is, oh no, this one corresponds to this and this one corresponds to this, but it's not. So it basically what happened is that, uh, what we believe is that the red syndrome neurons are trying to compensate for the deficits that they have at the single neuron level and they're trying to implement a different dynamics that may be efficient to produce uh, synaptic transmission and connectivity in the initial periods of development. But at some point, this dynamic is not, is not long lasting. It runs and then that's where you see that the red syndrome phenotypes start to, to, um, to have issues uh, or, or to have uh, uh, the developmental uh, delays and, and problems. So, and I think that this hasn't been answered yet. This is some published data. If you have any idea of this, that would be super cool uh, uh, to, to, to share with us and to look at. Um, all right, so why is important to have all these databases and I think for us to collaborate in this project? Because we can have, uh, 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 if we have this data, we can have uh, analysis of cortical dynamics at different levels and we can build computational models and network theories about that and from these models you can have more predictions that feed into the experimental pipelines. So I'll give you an example. So there is a, uh, this work by the way was doing by um, Lyle Muller who was a postdoc with Terry Sanoski. Now he's with us at, um, at uh, a Western in Canada. So this biophysical model was done using an adapted integrated and firing neuron model. So those are neurons that are modeled through uh, differential equations and they have different properties. Um, and his par each parameter has a biological correlate. And I, I, I don't pretend to explain the equations here, but these basically are Hawking and Huxley type of model uh, equations where you can model the dynamic of the action potential as well as the spike trains. And what I wanted to, to that this, this model has different conductances uh, here and this one, uh, particularly what we call it the GA, uh, which is an adaptation conductance, is a conductance that makes the cells to adapt. So when the cells get activated, at some point the cell adapt and it doesn't fire any more action potentials and has to do with the leakage and the movement of ions and, uh, across the membrane. So these conductances, they have their biological correlate. And when you do that, you can model actually a single neuron using this, and you can go also into the Allen website, and there are several models that they have used for this. Um, but if you're a modeler, uh, you will understand. I mean, um, there is certain things with the model, so the model doesn't have the same changes in the height of the action potential has this little thing at the end that is like hyperpolarization that happens at the end. So models are not perfect and can always be tweaked. But this model was sufficient for us to actually to model the IPS uh, uh, C network. And, and we can simulate actually through this model, the, uh, at this model, by the way, the hundreds and, and, and thousands of neurons, you can simulate um, the, uh, the network activity using this model. So these are the bursting activity with the simulation network and these are the IPSC network. And you can also do a, a analysis, for example, using power uh, spectrum density. So uh, what you have here is the frequency of the network, uh, the MECP2 in blue and yellow. And what you have here with, in red is superimposed the frequency of the model. So basically the model adopts the same frequency as the network in general. So this is a, it's a narrow way to summarize this. There is more complexity on this, but uh, the main point, and those are harmonics of the main frequency. If you concentrate in this one here, uh, you see how the main frequency of the network is uh, in the network and the model. Now, what happens in the red syndrome if you use the same tools for the analysis and you actually um, uh, uh, modulate the adaptation current? So just by changing the adaptation current, in the model, all these parameters, you can change many things. But in here, Lyle, by changing the adaptation current, he could obtain, he could replicate what he finds in the red syndrome uh, phenotype. So basically, what are 
the, what is the importance of that? Because, um, I mean, you may ask that the adaptation current, we know what, what causes adaptation in neurons. We know which ion channels cause adaptation in neurons. So now we can reverse that back into uh, physiology of the membrane and even go back into uh, the genetics of this and find exactly what happened and generate predictions. So that's the importance of that. And uh, maybe this cellular, initial cellular deficit that the MECP2 null neurons have cascade into this series of deficits that we have see, seen uh, right here. So um, I'm going to, to get to the conclusions. I'm a little bit of an hour now, um, uh, or close to. And my conclusions won't be about the red syndrome. Uh, uh, you already saw the, the data. My conclusions are going to be uh, aimed at trying to promote the collaboration between molecular and system neuroscientists. And I think that I'm on that mission. Um, system neuroscientists, to start with, could embrace the fact that stem cell derived networks, 2D and organoids, are systems that resemble the fissures of developed nervous systems. They're a good system to study because the systems are less complex. We can use the tools of system neuroscience to explore the neurophysiology of stem cell derived net neurons and networks and to link systems and molecular neuroscience. I think that this is going to take us really far if we can do this. The stem cell technologies can provide unique access to study human circuits that remain inaccessible to many system neuroscience invas invasive tools. And we make very slow progress in invasive tools. We are starting recording actually single neurons in humans now, and, and we have many limitations to do that. So I'm gonna come back to the, to the sand clock. Uh, we have molecular neuroscience on top. We have system neuroscience right um, uh, at the bottom, and these are the big bulks of, of what we are doing now in many neuroscience programs, you can see that. And we have this transition that I believe that systems like organoids could really plug into these transitions and make a bridge between the molecular and system neuroscience, something that individual labs are doing already here, uh, many things. But I think that if we, uh, you, if we make a task force to, to do these kind of things, um, I think that we could um, uh, obtain a lot of knowledge. So um, I'm just going to end with my two bigger revelations, that the genome is a cookbook and cortical circuits are my following recipes. I think that uh, I must learn more about this. I recognize and I acknowledge that. Uh, but a lot of things that appeared to me were done to plasticity and acquired um, experience in the past, uh, it looks like they're very strongly genetically programmed, like a cell type, for example. Uh, it is in principle possible to make brain circuits using recipes and connect them to the living brain. And this is something that I see in the horizon so, and brain repair may be possible if we can engineer that kind of uh, 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 harvest the, the, the strengths of those things. There are many challenges and many of you acknowledge and recognize that, uh, but I think that still, I believe that it may be possible. So the, the people that this, this was, um, these are my, my, my uh, uh, lab. Uh, Kartik is a computational neuroscience student that he's just doing that only, uh, the same thing as Milat. Um, and uh, of course, that couldn't have been possible if I wouldn't have gotten together in this Toronto uh, rainy day that we have to stay inside with James Ellis uh, uh, and Mike Salter later on. And I think that uh, James has a Rebecca and Fraser. And now something that, that we do is we have weekly meetings actually with James uh, now to discuss all the things that we could do with this. And, uh, and I'm very enthusiastic about um, taking this further. Um, and thank you very much. What questions, uh, any questions out here in the audience that you'd like to pose? So it's very exciting to have the possibility of repairing brains. And so you're suggesting growing organoids and then implanting them? Where there's probably all different schemes, but can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, um, I think that. Uh, many of the things that you encounter in neurology or neurosurgery is that sometimes you have to take full parts of brains and, and you don't get functionality for these parts of brain at, at any time. So um, the way that I see this, humans 
l let me just start from, from a principle that may be to explain my logic. Humans, we have factories of making humans. I mean, that's what we do. We make humans, we reproduce, right? But we don't have spare parts. This is very different in the automobile industry. They do have spare parts. They could fix things. We can't fix things. I think what I saw in stem cells and, and the development of organoids, um, maybe not exactly uh, organoids the way that you see them right now, it would be the possibility to integrate those organoids into the brain. And of course, the challenge is how are you going to wire those organoids? Are those organoids going to generate epilepsy? Are you going to generate more damage than, than things? But um, I do believe that if you can implant an organoid and the organoid can acquire functionality, you may be able, in certain part of the brain, for certain things, you might be able to repair the brain. One of the things, actually, yesterday I was listening to um, an interview with uh, Pasca uh, at, uh, at Stanford. I think that he implanted some in somatosensory on the rat, some of the human organoids, um, and then they wire. So actually, they they respond to some sensory stimulation. Rusty has done that too, and we, big collaboration, and they do acquire functionality. Um, now, can we harvest? that really and, and make this functionality functional for behavior? That's the big question. As a system neuroscientist, I think that this fascinates me because that's, we use microstimulation, we use optogenetics, we use different things to, to explore the cortex. But here we may use this tool to program those organoids, to program the cortex. Maybe we just have to desynchronize them and make it a stochastic instead of, of this uh, firing. Uh, maybe we have to put more into neurons. Maybe we have to put more glia. Maybe we have to do things like that. I do believe that it has a future. I don't think that we're there yet, but I believe that it is possible. Um, yeah. That actually gets to one of the questions that did come on Zoom, which is how well do you think you can control an organoid to give you the cell types that you want uh, that reflect the diversity of the brain? Is it purely stochastic or, or I'm, I'm reading some of, something into what, what this questioner is asking, but um, I guess if you want the organoid to reflect the diversity of the brain, how much control do you have to, to, to get the same patterns over and over again so you can get reproducible and interpretable data? So I, um, I, I will try to answer the question to my best. I'm not the expert in organoids, so basically it's rusty on many of the people here, but, uh, but this is what I have learned. I think that the process is more deterministic than what we thought, at least until certain developmental stages. So you can make four brain uh, organoids and you can make uh, cortical organoids, and you can have organoids in which you have interneurons and organoids in which you don't have interneurons. You can have uh, astrocyte and rich organoids. Uh, so basically, there is a lot of things that you can control in those organoids in the architecture of the circuits. Now, um, this, um, um, this comes to really to the question comes to how much do you need input and neural activity to shape the, the, the function of the organoids and to make it mature. And I do believe that the system, uh, the makeup of the, of the cortical unit, for example, um, uh, if you have cells like PV cells connect to pyramidal cells and they uh, uh, actually target the cell body of pyramidal cells. Is that a genetic program or is that something that uh, is just activity dependent? Or it is a combination of both. I think that many of those things that I seems to be like, for example, interneuron migration has been shown in organoids that interneurons can migrate from one organoid to another, actually, when the so I, those genetic programs are quite deterministic from the perspective that, that I think. And I think that my answer would be this. We will be able to harvest the deterministic nature of those genetic programs uh, quite well in the lab when we are making those organoids because you have the genome editing, editing tools. There is many media, uh, bioengineering. But at the point where you will need neural activity, pattern activity, you need sensory systems coming in with a certain you know, environmental statistics of, of the patterns of activity, that's the point where we have to plug those activity patterns and shape the organoid. So in principle, I think that how do you see, where do you put that line? I think that is fuzzy to me now, but the way that I have witnessed this is that the line seems to be stretching more, 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 
uh, in favor of the molecular programs because you can obtain dopaminergic neurons, you can obtain many things actually with the organoids now. Uh, that would be my answer. So I understand you're trying to identify the patterns behind disease versus non-disease, right? Using so-called like fingerprinting using your uh, methods. But is there any way that um, electrophysiology, multi-electrode IRAs can inform on mechanism of disease? Yeah, um, I think that the, the, the way that, that I see this, the system starts with the genetic code. And then you build a system um, that is not just fit forward, the system. So the system also has a feedback component, probably in each one of the aspects of the system, where you're looking at molecular networks, where you're looking at regulatory genes, actually. Um, there is a feedback aspect of the system. Now, when you get to the point that you have the action potential and you have neural activity and you have uh, receptor potentials, that's where the electrophysiologists come in. And that's where we have to determine how much those signals, how much do they actually will um, influence the network. Uh, during disease, I think that during the REP syndrome, I think that what we have shown and others have shown before us is that the molecular machinery is impaired. So what you're getting neurons that they don't look, and you're, they still will produce action potentials and you will have a development of the system. But at some points, maybe the feedback that you need into that, maybe the, the energetic, demands of the system, maybe things like that would collapse and degenerate into uh, some sort of pathology. That's the way that we show you a very small thing for the red syndrome. I can tell you we are doing something with Chang2 mutation and it seems to be that Chang2 mutations goes opposite to the red syndromes. The neurons are accelerating because they are hyperconnected. And this is something that James is working in now. So mechanisms of disease are so diverse but you know, we have the luxury, as system neurophysiologists, of the reduced dimensionality when you go to these measurements of single neurons. A luxury that you don't have um, when you look at molecular networks. And when you expand into multi-network, multi-neurons networks, and you expand that, we also don't have the luxury anymore because we have cell types, we have connectivity patterns. So I think that this is something that is happening. And disease expands all of that. It could inform, yes, I would, I would believe that it could inform. Could that be a biomarker for diagnosing a disease or things like that? I mean, this is a very complex question. I, I wouldn't take any sides on that. I wouldn't say no, but for now, I find difficult to do that. There is one thing. In epilepsy, for example, we are seeing a large number of neurons that produce this bursting phenotype. And that, th there's things that could be very strong. Like in genetics, you can have a gene that has a very strong penetrance and you know, and you have that. So in electrophysiology, you can have phenomena that has so strong that you know that they will cause some disruption in the network. We could identify some of those, but uh, there are not that many. Yeah. And it's also an avenue for like trying different mutations, answering different questions, and then you, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. You have the, the, the ideal uh, environment to do that. Okay. Well, that leads into uh, one of the questions. We're going to the Zoom now, and I'll combine them. Uh, one is, uh, can, do you feel that, and this is purely speculative, obviously, can you make a connection between the genetic mutation in RETS, MECP2, and what it does, and what you're seeing electrophysiologically? And then the second question is, uh, Rett syndrome is part, has classically been considered to be one part of the autism spectrum disorder. Do you see that pattern in other autism spectrum disorder members? Yeah, uh, th that's a very good question. So the, I think that the, the first answer is like the way that we're trying to connect that now. We're trying to connect the deficits that we see in single neurons and synaptic, uh, decreasing the number of synapses to what we see in those phenotypes. And, um, but we don't know if it is a compensatory thing what we see in the networks or if it is something that is resultant directly from, from that. So one possibility is that the networks are trying to compensate. So, and then you see this network phenotype because the deficits that you find in the, in the, uh, in the single neurons. So um, I think that the second question was? Second question was, Given that Rett syndrome is part of the whole autism spectrum disorder, 
Do you see this as a phenotype across different types, different members of this spectrum? But it also, I, I mean, you also brought up an interesting point that this could be a comp compensatory pattern that you see whenever something is going wrong. But do you yeah. see this uh, in other members of the autism spectrum disorder? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So uh, the other things that we have done is the shank two that um, uh, we are studying this phenotype now, and what we see is the opposite. Uh, but shank two is a gene that has been involved in many, not only autism, so many many disorders. Uh, and what we see is the opposite thing that the the shank two neuron seems to accelerate and seems to hyperconnect. So uh, it's very hard because the autism spectrum disorder is is defined um, the way that I see this uh, is defined by the symptomatology. The diagnosis is still done by a clinician. Mm -hmm. You don't actually take, a, you know, a, a, and it's defined by the same symptomatology. But the symptoms and the behaviors are the result of such a complex uh, system. So to give you an example, you can have different genotypes that they converge to the same phenotype in the, in the networks that we see, a slowdown of that. You could even obtain that pharmacologically. And the problem with that is that um, when you see the same symptomatology in, the, in autism, and then you go down to the number of mutations that have been associated, uh, or genes that have been associated to that, that I think that there are more than 400 now, according to the Simons database. Um, for me, I was thinking, how do I make sense of this? And the only thing that I can think about is that when you have the, the metabolic pathways, and you have many metabolic pathways, you have many ways to converge into a single thing, which is could be a neuron that is functional, that produces potentials and connect to other neurons. And there is no single, probably, recipe. There are many ways to do that, that the different pathways could compensate or not. So they, they could actually have different um, um, uh, amounts of a certain protein, of a certain enzyme activity. And I was... Uh, 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 so I, I thought about that the first time with Mike um, uh, Strong. That he, Michael Strong is a ALS researcher, and he talked to me and said, "Well, I'm looking at those mRNAs, and they're all over the place. They're they're different in different patients, and they have the different phenotype." And ALS. I'm putting the example here. I'm, I'm bringing the example because it's more it's the most simple uh, case. Not the the disease. The disease is devastating, but the the condition is uh, and the findings are very. Um, so what happened is that maybe you have multiple things that it's bringing you to the same phenotype. So it's very hard to, to do that. And when you go all the way to the genome, I think that this is probably what we are witnessing now in the, um, um, with all these genes that are uh, that. So uh, the answer is that we don't see the same things, at least for the two genes that we have been um, studying. Um, and the, the question is also how much downstream can we see? Because with these networks, we cannot see much of the development happening downstream. Even in some of these uh, red syndrome networks, they start having a phenomenon that is called reverberation at some point that we are studying now. And we don't see, we see the opposite in the Shang 2, that the Shang 2 has fewer reverberations at the red syndrome. So um, I'm sorry that I don't have a good answer for that, but. My answer is that it is a complex condition, the autism, and I think that I would expect different findings at different stages of development when you study that, that would converge at the end into a very similar phenotype. Great, thank you. You had a question over there? Yeah, so my question is a bit out of the autism, but have you have any experience with Alzheimer's disease? Um, you know, with all these uh, organ organoids, and and if that would be possible, should be a possible possible disease modifying um, treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So I, I'm not an expert on Alzheimer's disease, so I don't I don't. But uh, I can give you my opinion. I think that uh, organoids can contribute to Alzheimer's disease if you can. Uh, create uh, circuits that actually would have the similar um, um, makeup as the circuits that are affected by Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
And if you can create the pathology in those organoids, I think that you can potentially do that. I know that there are people like Rusty Gage here at the Salt that has been intensively researching on that, looking at, at uh, the effect of uh, astrocytes, different things on that. I believe that this, the, it could be useful. Um, but I also should say that uh, the way that I approached this at the beginning was like uh, organoids, uh, when you have a very strong phenotype, I think, and, and you have a very strong connection to the genome, for example, to genotypes and, and mutations. I think that that might be a good way to start with organoids. In Alzheimer's, there are some familiar like mutations that that's probably what they are starting with. Um, but uh, th these are, this is a point to start now. A lot of the phenotypes are actually not, it's, it's the same thing happened in autism, right? Or either we haven't found them, or we, or, or we don't know that, or they're like, like complex, uh, uh, multi-level things. Um, yeah, I, that would be my guess is that for the very strong uh, penetrance genes and things like that might be the first things where you may see a contribution of those uh, systems. Thank you. Right, We're starting to run out of time. I'm gonna quickly combine two questions from, uh, from the same question or came on Zoom. One is, do you think you can actually teach a particular pattern to a stem cell derived network? And the second question from the same uh, questioner is, does pruning change your patterning at all? The kind of normal pruning that you get uh, in development. So um, being able to teach and then what effect does pruning have? So uh, I think that I could answer the first one. Yes, I think that we can program those organoids because uh, the good thing is about these networks are developing. And if you are actually able to tap into uh, stimulation patterns, I believe that, yes, that, that's my... And in fact, I think that these things have been already uh, researched. Um, the second one is about the pruning. I don't think that I'm the best uh, person to answer that, but I think that the... The pruning has a lot to do, at least when you look at the visual system, for example, when you look at ocular dominance columns and things like that, pruning has a lot to do with patterns of activity. So basically, um, um, when synapses are used and they're going, uh, um, so synapses are maintained, when at least in primary visual cortex, when synapses are stopped to be used, then you stop this synapse, start to retract, and then you have the pruning of synapses. I think that the answer would be given probably, but how much simulation patterns can we inject in the organoid, and how much can we morph the physiology of the organoid with those simulation patterns? I believe that pruning will happen, of course, at some point. Um, but um, at this point, I think that this is very early to tell. Yeah. There's uh, one last more technical question about patch clamping and uh, do you, is it believed in the field that when you patch a cell at a particular region that that reflects what is present in that neuron all throughout, its oh. dendrites and its axons? Yeah, um, so the, 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 the question is if the cell would be like a round body and then we just patch it there and everything is homogeneous, sure we will know what is happening, but that's not the case. So I think that the, the answer question is no, we don't know. But full body cell patch clamp is the tool that we're using now. Yeah, uh, you have to do dendritic. You, you need other tools to know what happens exactly in other parts of the neuron. Yeah. Great. Um, and with that, thanks so much, Julio. This is great, great way to, to launch 2023 with some very thought-provoking approaches to how do we, how do we bridge uh, molecular neuroscience and systems neuroscience and stem cells sit right there at uh, kind of at the fulcrum of that, which is pretty exciting. Thanks for attending and we'll see you next month for the February installment of the Southern California Stem Cell Consortium. Bye-bye. Thank you.